Uh, hi everyone, we're gonna take a few minutes to wait for more people to come in and then we're gonna get started. Okay, um, so I think we can start now. Um, okay, um, so... Okay, Michael, can I start now, right? <laughs> yes, please. Sure, sure, sure. Okay, um, yeah, so uh, hi, hi, hello, hello again, everyone. Um, good afternoon from Thailand and welcome you all to the third webinar um, in the our Mekong, our Say webinar series. Um, in this webinar, we're going to focus on making room for civic engagement in national resource government. It, sorry, in national resource management. Um, so you might familiar with my face already. My name is Palita. I am the Mekong Program Officer at the Internews Earth Journalism Network. Uh, a lot of people call us EJN, and I will be a moderator today. Um, and then before I start, um, I want to announce that we have Burmese and Khmer simultaneous interpretations. You can switch to this language channel um, by clicking on the interpretation icon at the bottom of your screen. And um, anyone who want to listen in English, you can just stay here uh, with, with me. Okay, um, so now let me take a few minutes to give you the background of this webinar. Um, so um, this webinar is part of the EJN One Year Project called Our Mekong, Our Say, funded by USAID Mekong for the Future. Um, in this project, we focus on building local journalist capacity to report on national resource governance. Um, and we also try to increase public access to information relating to environmental issue and national resource management. And this is where this webinar come in to provide you more update and information about specific topic and theme we set up in each webinar. Um, and for today, our main theme would center around civic engagement in the Mekong region. And as you might already know that the shrinking civic space has created a lot of challenges for organizations and individuals defending the environment, um, including the media and civil society groups. And I think you might see a lot of examples across the region. You might hear about the suspension of conservation projects in Myanmar because of the military coup, or you might hear about the leaks that Cambodia journalists have been facing um, after reporting on some critical issue like land lives or deforestation. And, and there is also a regional effort to ensure civic space um, and the protection of environmental human rights defenders that require a lot of coordination in different political system. And we will hear about all of this from our speakers who come from uh, different organization, uh, from international organization to media and civil society, um, who will tell you more about their work and the challenges uh, on the ground working in this area. And you also will hear more about the solution and efforts of their organization and the people they are working with to increase the civic space. Um, and I also want to emphasize that, um, you know, this effort are something that we really want to bring in, in in this webinar because they provide us more hope and maybe offer ideas to you all about like how we can move forward from here. I think that's pretty much everything I want to say. So um, let me turn to the speakers. So we have three speakers right now um, and 
can I ask each of you to introduce yourself to the audience? Um, maybe start with Long Chat, please. Thank you very really much, Parita. Uh, good afternoon from Thailand, everyone. My name is Lomsat Vachila Ratanakongund. I work with the UN Human Rights Office, Regional Office for Southeast Asia, right. and I work at Local Point on climate change and environment and cover Asia since 2019. Thank you very really much. Okay, we. <laughs> Yeah, thank, thank you, uh, Parita, and good afternoon, uh, everyone. Uh, my name is uh, Vi. I'm the currently uh, the founder and also executive director of Cambodian Journalist Alliance Association based in Phnom Penh, Cambodia. Uh, Cam Cambo Cambodia has been uh, uh, working to uh, you know uh, promote access to information through our critical uh, reporting on uh, human rights, climate change, and also environment. Uh, land right as well. Uh, uh, we also uh, have been supporting two journalists through capacity building and also our monitoring on uh, journalist harassment program. Thank you. And then Paul. Hello, yeah, thank you very much, Marita. My name is Paul Sintwa. I'm currently the executive director of the Korean Environmental and Social Action Network. Uh, also, um, a couple of other hats that I'm also wearing. Uh, currently, also serving as the uh, chairperson of the Selling Peace Park, and the kind of uh, yeah taking uh, part in the uh, regional and and global level ICCA consortium as a council member. Yeah, thank you very much. Thank you, thank you, you all. Um, so um, the way we're gonna run this webinar is we will ask each of speaker to um go through their presentation for allow ten to twelve minutes, and then we will have Q and A section at the end of the webinar. But in the meantime, if you all want to ask anything to the speaker, you can just drop your questions in the Q and A box. Um, you will see the the icon at the bottom of the screen. Um, and then uh, I will help collecting the questions and ask speaker for live answers. I think that's all for the introduction. Um, let's start like the real webinar. Um, so can I begin with Lomshat? Um, so so at the UN Human Rights, I think you have been involved you know, with a lot of effort to promote environmental human rights across Southeast Asia and, and even beyond. Um, so when actually when I heard you speaking at another event, I was like, I, I have to get you here. You're the right person to give the overview of the civic space in our region. So maybe Lamshad, can you give us this overview and tell us more about what, what you are doing right now? So the floor is your... Thank you very much. I am not sure if you see my screen already. Yes. Yes, thank you very much, Harita. And as I already introduced myself, I work with the UN Human Rights. And many of you might not really familiar yet why Human Rights Office have to do or something to do with the environment. That's why I think it would be really useful to give you the overview about the work of the UN Human Rights Office. And we are the UN agencies, of course, that have the uh, leading agencies that working on promotion and protection of human rights. And since like even beyond uh, 20, 18th before we really start the a uh, specific uh, focus on climate change and environment we are working uh, on closely with the civil societies and uh, support the government uh, national human rights institution or civil society to protect and promote human rights that relate to land water and environment but since the effort has been made for many, many decades, and we already know that the relationship between human rights and, and environment are very, very uh, intertwined. So 
just last year, in 2022, the UN General Assembly adopted a resolution on the human rights to clean, healthy, and sustainable environment. And this resolution was adopted after the same similar resolution adopted by the Human Rights Council in 2021. And these resolutions has been acknowledged as the landmark resolution because it was adopted with 161 votes and, and with uh, in favor, zero against, and eight abstention. And this resolution is really important because this is the first time that the international uh, communities or even under the UN system recognize the right to clean, healthy, and sustainable environment as a human right. What I really want to highlight here is that this resolution also recognizes that the exercise of human rights, including the right to seek, receive, and impart information to participate effectively in the conduct of government and public affairs and to an effective remedy is really vital to the protection of human rights and sustainable environment. However, this is the global and latest global development. But what I really want to really focus in this webinar is the role, very important role of the environmental human rights defenders. And the terminology or the wording of environmental human rights defenders, or what we call EHRDs, have been first introduced by the UN Special Rapporteurs on the situation of human rights defenders. And in his report to the Human Rights uh, Council in 2016, which is the very first report that really uh, demonstrated the alarming situation of human rights defenders that working in the area of environment and land uh, has been facing the vital or uh, the serious violations. But in his report, he referred the innovative human rights defenders as the individuals or group, their personal or professional and full manner strive to protect and promote human rights that relate to the environment. And as stated by, by the UN Special Rapporteurs, the definition of immortal human rights defenders defined by their action, not by their names, because in his report, he said that the immortal human rights defenders come from many different backgrounds and work in different ways. Some are lawyers or journalists, but many are ordinary people living in remote villages, forests or mountains, and they may not even be aware that they are reacting at environmental human rights defenders. However, linked to the uh, UN General Assembly resolution, the environmental human rights defenders act as the agents of change in protecting environmental and standing up for communities or individuals who are disproportionately impacted by environmental harms through many means. For example, through awareness campaign, uh, to litigation, advocacy, or other means, including protest. However, uh, we already know and we have heard many, many examples or see in the news that they are facing a serious threat and intimidation. That's why I want to share the global picture because before linking to our region in Macomb, this situation of the environmental human rights defenders has been the global trend that's why I share this picture and the report from Global Witness. Uh, since I, I believe many of you have known or read their reports for 10 years already, they are the first organization that have been collect the uh, document, the issue of killings against land and environmental defenders. So in 2022, they released this report that uh, have the summary of the killings of immortal Himalayan defenders in the past decade or 10 years. So if, if you can see from this picture, 
it has been shown that 1,733 1, land and defenders were killed since 2012 to 2021. And the number has been added by last year report that additional 170 defenders has lost their life for protecting the planet and bringing the number of killed to almost 2,000 already. So on average, and defenders will kill every other day in 2022. But when we look into like the comparative figure, the number, the number has been slightly lower than 2021, like from 200 record killings to 170, 70 killings. However, I really have to emphasize that this is not mean the situation has been significantly improved because the report of the global, global witness only record the, the later attack or violation, which means killing. But what has been increasing is the non lethal strategies such as criminalization, harassment, and digital attack and that are being used to silence the defenders. So this is the global trend. Coming back closer to our region, in our, in our region, one important issue that I have to stress is that in Asia Pacific, we still lack of the comprehensive data on the attacks against environmental human rights defenders in Asia Pacific. So I would like to share very important report from Forum Asia as well that has record uh, the violation, which us our law already include both uh let lethal attack and non lethal attack, like all form of attack and intimidation. So as you can see, the attacks against defenders have increased every year, and the latest number last year is that there were three hundred thirty thirty three cases of violations against land and indigenous environmental and community based defenders, which also affect more than 1059 individuals and organization but all of what i have been said is not just to share the number this is not the number this is the life this is the 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 violation against people who has to be supposed to be seen as the hero for their action to protect our livelihood our land or environment that's why I want to share that for OUN Human Rights Office, our mandate is to advocate for the human rights based approach to climate change and environmental policy. We advocate on behalf of environmental human rights defenders and to work and advocate for the inclusion of individuals or civil society to be part of the in on home matters, a uh, decision making process. That's why since 2021, uh, UN Human Rights Office, uh, Asia and Pacific, together with the UN Environment Program, has organized the Asia Pacific and Human Rights Defenders Forums. And the latest forum that was just organized just last month, with the focus on the data collection. And the sub theme this year is the how the defenders engage with the media. So the main uh, purpose of this forum is to connect defenders around Asia Pacific to discuss the key issue in the region. Since it was just organized and we are working on the report, I just want to share that this is the uh, outcome of the forum that we have been discussed. We have the sub regional discussion about the trend, the threat, the barrier, and the need of environmental human rights defenders across Asia Pacific. In this, uh, I am not sure if you can see this, but in the uh, right hand side, light bottom, this is the uh, see, uh, the outcome of the discussion of the Southeast Asia 
and you can see that in Southeast Asia, defendants have been discussed and shared that the main threats for defenders working on land and environment is violence, harassment, and intimidation, criminal criminalization, slap, lack of community protection, and of course, civil society are excluded from decision-making process. And my last slide here, I just want to share the regional trend mm -hmm. from uh, our work uh, in the region. We have been monit monitoring the situation of attacks against environmental human rights defenders. And we see that the trend in Mekong region and even beyond across Asia Pacific, we see that because of the growing demand of the of the extraction for sea fuel and exploitation of natural resources has been increasing uh, and uh, adding with the issue of corruption, impunity, and the competition between economic development has been the big issue in the region. And since this is a really good timing that we are so close to COP28, we have seen a lot of new initiatives under the name of climate change mitigation. But that we have been uh, informed or share about a lot of issues about uh, false climate solution or maladaptation that could force or uh, drive into the forced relocation of the local communities or even the impact of the new technologies that like high demand of the rare earth minerals that is necessary for the uh, high technologies or renewable energy. So in the picture in the map that I show in the right hand side, this is the uh, map of the location of that rare earth mining lo uh, location since you see, I and and you can see that Vietnam, Thailand, Myanmar is the location that has the potential of these rare earth mineral like lithium nickel that has been like competing for the green and just transitioned that means that we don't we the can we cannot forget the main just an inclusive transition to the uh to battle the climate mitigation my uh, the climate change impact and the big important and salient issue that Parita already shared the shrinking of civic space in the region come with the interference by the authorities with the rise of the peaceful assembly and freedom of association. We have seen the weaponizing of laws. We've seen already the defamation, the use of the incitement to cause uh, the, the charge against incitement to cause societal chaos. And we have seen recently now the charged under tax evasion or even in appropriating documents. We see the digital attack or information operations toward those who are have been claimed or seen by the government or authorities that they are offering this cause that are not in line with the government agenda and creative uh, negative perce perception of defenders as the enemy of the state or anti-development. So we see that there is a need of the protection and specific protection, even the legal protection in Latin America and the Caribbean, as well as the European, there are where there are the regional agreements on participation, access to information and access to justice in environmental matters, like it's a, it's a, it's a agreement and AHUS convention. So both of these regional agreements offer uh the protection of environmental human rights defenders, which is not exist yet in our region. So uh, presently, OSCHR and UN agencies, UN environment and UNSCAP uh, is, are actively supporting ongoing discussion in ASEAN 
to develop an evaluatorized framework that could specify similar protection in ASEAN countries. So this is the latest uh, development in the global level and even ASEAN level. So I will stop my presentation here and looking forward to, to see or answer any questions. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Lomshad. And, and that's uh, really concerning with thousands of environmental human rights defenders have been killed and ha or harassed. Um, but it's also a good news that uh, the UN, uh, people at the UN level, you know, talking about this and make this uh, recognized. Um, and I think Paul and we can also talk more about the situation on the ground uh, in terms of uh, environmental uh, human rights defenders. Um, Okay, let me move on to we. Um, so we um I think um based on what what Lomsha just presented, um I think media play a big role in ensuring that this environmental human right exists and not being violated. Um, and I I I'm aware that Cambodia News, uh, where you are working at, um actually um cover a lot of story about land right and, and, and environmental issue and, and it's quite um, sensitive there. Um, so can you tell us more about your experience on the ground relating to, to the how media dealing with this limited speak space um, and how you manage to survive? Uh, thank, thank you uh, again, uh, Parita, and good afternoon again, everyone. Uh, yeah, uh, please let me uh, just, you know, introduce about, uh, you know, how the Cambodian journalists cover on the environmental aspect and also, uh, you know, land rights uh, and also uh, related to, you know, other subjects, uh, which is uh, links to the environment and also climate change in Cambodia. Actually, you know, uh, uh, Cambodia, uh, we is the you know, journalist association in, in the country. Uh, but we also uh, have been operating the online media outlet, uh, which uh, part of our intention to promote access to uh, credible information and also critical content in uh, Cambodia. So through our uh, Cambodia News platform, we have uh, CambodiaNews.com. Uh, we uh, publish hundreds of the uh, online news content related to human rights, freedom of expression, uh, land rights, and also environmental, as well as the journalist uh, stick related issue, uh, which harms to their work and also uh, violations to the freedom of press and uh, freedom of expression as well. So uh, let me just, uh, you know, introducing how, you know, uh, we are challenging in reporting on land rights and also environmental in Cambodia. Uh, I just uh, want to start my presentation with the context of Cambodia, uh, you know, freedom on the net, uh, which is uh, partly free, uh, you know, based on uh, our, uh, based on the report of, of human, uh, of uh, the Freedom House. And also the press freedom, uh, you know, uh, slightly decreased uh, in 2000, uh, in 2023, while we, uh, you know, slide down uh, to 147, uh, compared to uh, 128 uh, in 2016. Uh, you know, uh, regarding to the internet freedom, uh, you know, remaining uh, under threat in Cambodia, while internet users uh, often face arrest uh, for online activity, uh, perpetrating and uh, also environment that, uh, you know, uh, they, they have been uh, working and also reporting un under fear and also uh, cell sensitive. Uh, journalists, uh, activists, and including human rights defender, they are continue to face uh, physical and also uh, online harassment uh, because of their works uh, reporting and also working to promote uh, uh, human rights and also freedom of expression. Uh, through the monitoring program uh, by uh, of the uh, my association, Cambodian Journalist Association, uh, we have monitored at least uh, 24 cases uh, which happened to uh, 30 journalists, including citizen journalists who were harassed and uh, threatened uh, in the uh, nine months of 2023. Uh, online reporter and independent journalists, uh, uh, independent media 
a reporter got online sexual harassment as well, especially, you know, after the uh, uh, latest uh, independent online media outlet called uh, Way of Democracy uh, was uh, enforced to shut down by Cambodian government in February early this year. Uh, at least uh, five online media license were revoked by Ministry of Information because to operate a media license in Cambodia, you have to re uh, register and request for media license from Ministry of Information. And the license has to be renewable, you know, every year. So uh, if the government not satisfied to what you have been reporting, then uh, they, they may uh, not consider us to, re to renew uh, your license. Uh, through the uh, internet uh, censorship monitoring, we observed at least 15 uh, Khmer websites have been blocked by, uh, you know, ISP uh, in Cambodia. This included, uh, you know, uh, the, the uh, uh, website who have been, uh, you know, we is uh, publishing the uh, critical content from abroad as well. Uh, challenge on reporting on land rights and also environment. Uh, please let me just, you know, indicate to some case that, uh, you know, worst happened uh, and also challenges to the Cambodian journalists and also uh, have been uh, facing, uh, you know, challenge for the, the reporter, independent reporter as well. This is one case which happened to, uh, you know, the former of reporter of Way of Democracy, VOD, uh, who was reported about the, uh, uh, you know, forex clearance at the Tamau Mountain. It is a, a you know a, a zoo that uh, uh, nearest to uh, Phnom Penh. So uh, at least you know uh, five journalists uh, uh, from VOD and also for uh, environmental activists uh, from uh, Khmer Tavra was detained for about seven hours in in August two thousand twenty two. Uh, you know after they they uh, you know. Uh, 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 want to uh, report about the uh, forest clearance at uh, Tamau Mountain. Uh, the nine were arrested, uh, you know, about uh, uh, 11 a.m. in at Phnom Tamau. However, after negotiation and also uh, interven intervention from uh, the UN Human Rights Office in Cambodia and also other human rights uh, human rights uh, organization, journalists and activists were were released from detention. Uh, so another case, it related to, you know, the Tycoon Company, which receives more than 1,000 hectares, you know, along coastal water uh, 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 area in, in Kai province. It is the province, uh, you know, uh, at the coastal area where, you know, uh, the Tycoon Company has received uh, more than 1,000 hectares. And uh, there's a lot of uh, land land conflicts, you know, happen as well, while, you know, the uh, forest activists, they try to uh, protest again, the, uh, you know, filling the land into, into the sea, such as the satellite uh, map, you have seen uh, a rear of the land, which, uh, you know, was provided to the tycoon uh, company. Uh, regarding to the, you know, the, the uh, uh, land, uh, uh, Especially, you know, the area under the uh, uh, protect, protection, protective areas uh, uh, in Cambodia, you know, the uh, company uh, which owned by the tycoon always, you know, receives the, uh, you know, the, the uh, land concession from the government. And this is another case that government uh, gives, uh, uh, you know, uh, almost uh, uh, you know, 1,000 hectare in uh, Batum Sako. Batum Sako is the national park of the uh, Kingdom of Cambodia. Uh, that government also, you know, uh, cut, it, uh, cut area and provided it to the uh, uh, company owned by Oknya Katmeng, Tycoon Katmeng. Uh, he is own, uh, you know, the uh, big media company in Cambodia as well. And uh, the company owned by Kutmeng also uh, has uh, the joint venture business with the Chinese uh, company and also Vietnamese company. And they, uh, you know, operate the Seisan uh, Crown uh, 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 electricity dam, uh, which, you know, created a lot of, you know, impacts to the local people living at, uh, at the areas. Uh, this is also another case, uh, you know, uh, which uh, 
uh, the tycoon son also received, uh, you know, more than uh, 6,000 hectares in uh, Batum Sako as well, national parks, uh, Kong province uh, for the rubber plantation. And uh, this is also uh, creates a lot of, uh, you know, uh, protests, uh, protests uh, from the human rights defender and also activists at, at the ground. Uh, environment, uh, environmental ministry uh, demand in, uh, you know, like demand the, the uh, indigenous people in uh, one province, uh, you know, East, East North uh, Cambodia to uh, uh, apologize, you know, uh, after the office of Env environmental uh, department was uh, burned by the local community, uh, while, you know, the local community, they uh, protest uh, for uh, protecting their, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, community, their, their, their forest, and then uh, uh, they got angry with the, you know, the environmental officer there, and then uh, they decided to burn the office of the envi envi environmental offi officer. So, uh, uh, you know, uh, based on the case, uh, one journalist at the local area was questioned by uh, Ministry of Environmental as well. Uh, while Ministry of Environmental, they uh, suspect that the journalists, uh, you know, links to, uh, you know, the burning of their office. Uh, we also have another case that, you know, uh, because of the reporting uh, by the journalists uh, to the uh, forest clearance and also the land conflicts, so the journalists, uh, you know, got accusation and also uh, threatened from the local authority. And this is another case of, uh, you know, burning home in uh, the name of converse, uh, conservation uh, of the NGO called uh, Wildlife Alliance, uh, crackdown on, on the poor. And this is the case, you know, happened uh, at the Kadamon Mountains in Cambodia, uh, Pusat province. While you know, uh, uh, Cambodia reporter have reported uh, on their investigative story, and they also found uh, a lot of irregular, uh, you know, uh, uh, action uh, conducted by the uh, staff of Wildlife Alliance, and it's violate to the community people' right and freedom of expression as well. So uh, through this report. Uh, Cambodia reporter uh, got, uh, you know, the letter to editor uh, from the Wildlife Alliance uh, that uh, even though, you know, our reporter have uh, uh, interview and have a lot of evidence base uh, included into our article, but the letter to editor were publicly, uh, you know, uh, published by the Wildlife Alliance through their social media page. Uh, we aim to, you know, uh, critique and also to uh, violate the reputation of our news media outlet as well. And the Wildlife Alliance has been working very closely with the Ministry of Environment and Ministry of Agriculture in Cambodia. Uh, before a few, a few days before, you know, this article release and before the uh, Wildlife Alliance uh, wrote a letter to editor to Cambodia News. Uh, Cambodia New also got, uh, you know, another letter to editor from the Ministry of uh, Agriculture as well, uh, uh, through our reporting on the violence to uh, uh, agriculture activists, you know, which were happen, and uh, the activists, uh, you know, used to publish uh, on his social media, which mentioned uh, the name of the, uh, you know, uh, minister, the new minister of Ministry of Agriculture. So uh, through the report, uh, Ministry of uh, Agriculture and Minister uh, requested Cambodia News to delete, uh, you know, the minister name uh, from our article and threat us to, you know, shut down the media outlet lies, you know, government uh, practice to the void of democracy uh, in uh, February, uh, early of 2023. Uh, this is another case uh, that, you know, the, the community people living around, uh, you know, Uncle Wat, uh, it, is, it, it is the Apsara, Apsara uh, authority location. Uh, so the community people was, uh, you know, uh, uh, evicted and also uh, sent to live uh, around, you know, uh, 50 kilometer from uh, Siem Reap province, Siem Reap town. And uh, Cambodia news uh, reporter, they went there to cover, to monitor about the, uh, uh, you know, lies, the uh, uh, 
uh, how the authority uh, you know prepare for the people uh, who evicted and also uh, uh, like drainage and also uh, you know like health center education uh, uh, system as well so we have found uh, you know the blood on the location and we uh, reported the case uh, the former minister of uh, ministry of information you know uh, they uh, uh, he he uh, uh, print screen our story our picture and he also uh, compare to you know the uh, image designed by the government uh, about the area and then he uh, trying to provoke the bed and to you know uh, 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 expose the image that the Cambodia's news report uh, is not true while you know we trying to uh, provide the you know like the, the portrait of our picture from the real situation and also uh, the uh, another photo uh, exposed by the minister you know uh, uh, express about the uh, current current you know like uh, situation of the community uh, without showing any uh, you know like irregularity or any uh, you know bad uh, image or situation uh, so another story is uh, reporting about the pollution on the rivers in Battambang province. It's the closest to uh, Thai border. So uh, these rivers were polluted by the Chinese-owned company. Uh, at the first time, you know, the reporter reported about the case and uh, it, it, it was rejected by the local authority there. The local authority said that it it was it, it is the the fake news. However, without the investigation, they just you know uh, call the local journalists to question about the story as well. But later on, you know the investigate uh, in investigation conducted, so uh, the authority uh, decided to you know uh, order the company uh, to pay for the fine uh, uh, from the pollution on the water. Uh, can, I so, can I intervene? You have like allow one minute, sorry. <laughs> okay, okay. So, uh, yeah. So there, there are you know there are more 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 case, and uh, this is a case of you know the uh, forest activists who were uh, reverted. Uh, uh, you know they protest uh, again. The uh, you know they protest in front of Cambodia court. Uh, by asking to uh, you know uh, let them to go outside the country to receive a word. Uh, so we report about uh, you know the, the case as well, and uh, uh, we have been uh, you know uh, reporting uh, with the, those challenge. We have been reporting and also thinking to the way that we have to uh, intervene and to address the concern and also challenges regarding to accusations to the journalists who reported about the environment, about the land issue. And uh, this is the law, that the draft law that we concern uh, uh, put more restriction to the uh, work of journalists uh, while you know most of the media outlet in Cambodia right now they uh, transform to uh, publish their content online. And these three draft law will you know uh, put more restrictions to the online media outlet. Uh, this is the law that uh, we are now asking government to, uh, you know, to make amendment and to uh, revoke some of the uh, sub degree as well, uh, such as the National Internet Gateway, a less majesty law that uh, have been using to, uh, you know, accuse to the work of journalists. Like I have raised uh, some example of the accusation from uh, our reporting about. Uh, this is the law that we also request government to uh, make amendment as well, a penal code, uh, especially, you know, on the incitement, a law on association and non-governmental organization, uh, telecom law, and also the press law. And uh, we requested government to pass access to information law as well, while we thought that the law will, you know, uh, uh, give more space for access to uh, public information from the government. Uh, this is uh, what uh, the suggestion that I, I uh, you know, uh, uh, contribute and also uh, passing through uh, stakeholder uh, uh, <clears throat> that should, you know, uh, initiate to establish, you know, the local press council that can protect, you know, the work of journalists here uh, in order to uh, protect our freedom and also to respond to the government accusation. While right now, you know, government ministry, ministry of information, always put pressures to the work of journalists. Ensure that the uh, diversified stakeholder platform mechanism uh, exists. 
uh, in order to provide uh, you know engagement and also dialogue between stakeholders. Uh, the new initiatives such as you know the network and also the working group should be supported and strengthening in order to tackle all of those issues that I have raised. Uh, support to strengthen media viability because you know without uh, you know funding without uh, you know like uh, money, so uh, the journalists also cannot uh, you know implement you know their role, their works to uh, report on the environment and also human rights issue. So I think, uh, you, you know, those, those uh, you know, my recommendation and also input to the stakeholder. And I hope, uh, you know, uh, uh, journalists will gain more uh, support and also uh, uh, including the public uh, support in order to uh, produce content related to uh, land rights and also environment as well. Yep, so I think uh, that's all from my side, uh, Parita. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you, thank you. I always appreciate Cambodia works um, and thanks for um, highlighting how the journalists at your newsroom being threatened. It seems like there are so many cases happen. Um, so um, in consider of time, can I move forward to Paul? I think Paul and his organization, Kesan, also dealing with a, a tough situation after the military coup in 2021, um, which is, Right now, it's not really fairly for civil society organization to work on conservation projects um, on it or call for natural resource governance. So maybe Paul, you can give us an overview of the situation in Myanmar and, and how your organization are dealing with that. Thank you, uh, Arita, uh, for the space while we are talking about uh, shrinking spaces in the region and also in Burma, Myanmar. And uh, yeah, first of all, I also would like to acknowledge the um, many, uh, you know, human rights, uh, environmental human rights defenders who have been sacrificing their lives and, uh, uh, you know, human rights and also, yeah, for the greater cause of, of humanity. Yeah? So my uh, sharing of my presentation, today uh, uh, does not cover the whole uh, country, but specifically about uh, my work in the region where I work. So I know and understand that there are, you know, cases where the situation, the uh, uh, people, local communities and the human rights and uh, environmental like uh, defenders are facing, you know, it's even worse than where I am maybe. So yeah, I would like to focus on the, the area where I'm working. Huh? Um, I will like uh, touch on the uh, civil space in Myanmar in the pre-coup time and a little bit uh, in the post-coup. And then the, I would like to also touch upon the shifting opportunity and a new approach to civil space in Myanmar. Uh, civic space in Myanmar pre-coup. Civic space has always been uh, limited in Myanmar. In the public sphere, civil society was invited to play along with the central government's agenda. In recent years, uh, following a gradual turn towards a more democratic uh, system under the USDP and the NL NLD, civil society organizations, the came more visible, visibly involved in the decision-making processes around the national policy. CSO were involved in key decision-making bodies around the development of a national land law and were also invited from across the country to give feedback on the development of a forest and biodiversity policies. This supposed increase in civic space came with a different set of boundaries. Civil society was still limited by the central government with conversation limited to subjects that the central government was willing to talk about. Many subjects remain taboo, especially nature conservation. Talking about them, publishing and uh, research about them or conducting advocacy around them quickly led to 
or also other um, cons negative consequences or repercussion or jail sentences. One of our colleagues uh, came you know, came uh, face to face with this reality when he was forced to exile after exposing the risks of a proposed coal-fired power plant backed by local government. Another of our colleagues, Saumu, was less fortunate and was killed by the Burmese army in 2018 uh, on his way home from a protest calling for peace and respect for indigenous people's conservation. There was also another set of uh, invisible strings that limited civic space. Of course, it's funding. As is the case in many countries, the majority of civil society in Myanmar is reliant on funding from international donors, either directly or via NGOs, NGOs. This funding also comes with an agenda, usually seeking to shape a country in a particular uh, direction. This created a barrier where yes, so they fit with the international agenda or national agenda and the central government's talking points. So their voices and status uplifted with everyone else marginalized and isolated from the process. This drove a division in the already you know, divided country. The most marginalized and isolated communities, especially those in conflict zones and ethnic controlled borderlands were further isolated. Key voices in ethnic civil society were pulled into a dead end peace process that was also run parallel to the central government's legal reform and national development efforts. This served to put marginalized communities' voices into a small box hidden behind a complex peace process and made it even harder for communities and their allies to speak out against the destructive laws and large scale development projects being planned and approved on their lands by groups that did not represent them. As these borderlands are where the majority of Myanmar's valuable natural resources and best conserved natural landscapes are located, this means that conservation was conducted in total absence of people who lived in and had been protecting these landscapes for generations. This design was no accident as it allowed for the central government and Burmese military to expand their power into areas that uh, they have, uh, they could not take by force in the name of conservation. Through the establishment of national parks and mega dam projects, the central government could alienate communities from their heritage while keeping them silent. While um, there are some positive examples like the cancellation and or re-examination of some top-down conservation and development projects after concerted community-led protests, these are extreme exceptions to the rule and came at extreme risk to the communities involved. Uh, civil space in the in the military uh, in the Myanmar, no? post-coup situation. No? The military coup of February 1st, 2021, marked the end of Myanmar's sh short-lived reform era. Civil space was immediately annihilated and any form of dissent or protest has been met with continued violence and imprisonment. Especially during the first year after the coup, the extent of junta violence across the country was immeasurable. The collapse of the peace process has been the return of widespread armed conflict across the country. And many people across Myanmar have taken up arms against the junta and formed local militias. This is the clearest sign of a total absence of civil space. According to the All Burma Indigenous Peoples Alliance, the post-coup context has also seen a large rise in the targeting, arrest, 
and killings of environmental human rights defenders across the countries as the junta seeks to stabilize uh, its rule through exploiting the country's natural resources. Despite the massive increase in violence and suffering across the country, uh, though we started to also see the development of a different arena for community voices, with the collapse of the central government and the faltering of the peace process, there has been an increased willingness among international actors to engage with marginalized communities and the elected representatives, ethnic governing organizations, or they call it EAOs, ethnic arms organization, have proven among the chaos that they can still offer reliable infrastructure and services to communities in current control areas where case and works, where there are more than half a million uh, eternally displaced people, uh, many of whom have fled to ethnic control borderlands seeking safety from the junta's violence. This is uh, based on our current peace support network uh, updated report. Uh, international actors, including national development agency, have started to recognize the positive impacts of uh, ethnic governments and communities previously branded as rebels are increasingly being reframed as uh, governance. One of the clearest examples of this is the, our initiative, now the Selling Peace Path, a 6,700 square kilometers indigenous community driven nature and con uh, culture conservation area in our current territory. The Peace Park was originally founded in the, um, 2018 to give voice and decision-making power to communities who were excluded by this you know, central government you know, driven reform processes. Founded in the pre-coup contest, the Selling Peace Park aims to create a space for community voice and decision-making in a place where it has been denied by the central government. The Peace Park is built upon the foundation of current indigenous beliefs and knowledge and puts local communities at the center of decision-making and strategy. Through a popularly elected 106 member General Assembly and a series of themed working groups, the Peace Park brings together communities from almost 300 uh, indigenous territories to ambition and implement and approach to governance and conservation that is by the people and for the people. The Peace Park also aims to provide previously marginalized communities with a seat at the table when it comes to negotiating power by uniting the aims of the uh, Peace Park's community, the General Assembly will act as the advocate in future negotiation with the central government and the international bodies. Uh, the shifting uh, opportunity, you know, a new approach to civic space in Myanmar now. You know? Community-led bodies like the Peace Park offer a new path to civic space in conservation in Myanmar, where previously the agenda and limitation of civic space were driven by the motivation of the central government and the international actors. The Peace Park uh, offers a counterbalance where community voices are the loudest in the room. Uh, while the uh, Peace Park is the example of a positive step forwards for civic space in Myanmar, there is still a steep uh, mountain to climb. The continued chaos that the junta is unleashing on the nation make it impossible to say what the future holds for Myanmar. At the international scale, though, there is still a lot to say about civic space. Uh, a key component to the continued success of community-led uh, initiatives like uh, the, the Selling Peace Park is something I touched on earlier, access to funding. As we all know, decisions around the direction and availability of most fundings are made at their source. This, uh, this is deeply built into the nature of international development funding, and it, it's not something that is easy to change. I there thought... is room for yeah. Sorry, if you wonder, yeah. we are running out of time. Can you please wrap up? Sorry. <laughs> okay, so uh, uh, maybe I'll touch on the recommendation. Huh? Um, so uh, we, you know, like uh, want to encourage our like-minded organization, huh? including indigenous people and local communities, 
to unite uh, you know, in building our own civic space. Uh, global biodiversity loss and the climate uh, crisis are happening now. Uh, we need to work together through existing support structure, uh, what we can do in our region and our international level no? to protect uh, our territories, to document our territories, assert our rights and demonstrate the importance of indigenous and customary uh, knowledge. We know our ecosystem better than anyone else and it should be our voices that make decisions about them. While it is important to keep Negotiating with the powers that be, there is no more time to wait around for their approval. It's time for us to unite and bring our voices and knowledge to the world on our own terms. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Paul. Thank you for bringing out some more hope um, from the Indigenous People Movement. Um, I hope we can have more time to discuss this. Um, so actually, we kind of running out of time already, um, and I don't think we can run the Q&A section. Um, but um, we covered quite a lot today. Um, so uh, we will share the presentation from the speaker and also the webinar record uh, to you after the event. And I, I would like to say thank you to our speaker, to Lomshad, we and Paul for taking your time to prepare. Um, for this webinar and I hope that uh, what you have spoken about will lead to some form of collaboration. Um, I hope that the audience would um, see the whole picture of, of, of what you guys are doing or what the local organizations are doing. Um, so after this webinar, we will send you the online survey uh, that will take you no more than five minutes um, to complete it. So please provide the feedback for our future webinars and, and thank you and see you again soon. Okay, bye bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Yeah, thank you. Bye bye.